I'm really glad to see so many people here and concerned about our archaeology, and this is a wonderful opportunity. It's very rare that we can get archaeologists to come here and speak with us, so having this here is wonderful. I think it's been 10 years probably since we've had um, an archaeologist here in the area, so that's so we're, we're very happy to have you. This event is sponsored by the Dummerston Conservation Commission and the Dummerston Historical Society. And uh, if you care to leave a donation, we would appreciate it, uh, and we would divide it between the two organizations. And um, we, uh, the, the work that we do, uh, we, we use our money basically for educational programs like these, and so that we can have it uh, videotaped. This will be on BCTV so that um, many, many more people will see it than are here. Uh, and so, so that's part of what the contribution goes for. Part of it goes for the educational programs that we're sponsoring here at the Dummerston School and community programs that we sponsor. And the Historical Society has a regular schedule as well of um, educational programs. So without further ado, Jess. Thanks very sponsor. much. Well, thanks, folks. Um, I will go anywhere in the States, and I'm very happy to come to Dummerston. My sister-in-law's parents, uh, John and Karen Abel, just moved up uh, from Dummerston up to South Burlington, and they talk very fondly about it. I've been down here a couple times before they moved, and I love this area. Um, and um, I was just down here recently. Uh, September was Vermont Archaeology Month, and I was down at Bellows Falls doing an event um, uh, where we scanned the Bellows Falls petroglyphs, as well as the Vilas Bridge, um, with sort of cutting edge laser technology to be able to map them both in three dimensions. Um, and I don't think I saw any of you there, but um, if you're interested in that, it's on uh, Fact TV. You can look it up, and um, there's a half an hour interview that uh, Robert McBride did with all of us down there. Um, so I love this area, and, uh, and um, I'm very happy to be here, but um, I will say that uh, despite the Connecticut River's known importance to Native American and, uh, and uh, historic European and then American settlers, there is a relatively little documented archaeology, or, you know, thoroughly documented archaeological sites known, even on the Connecticut, and certainly to areas west of the Connecticut and east of the Green Mountains, it is very, um, very sparse indeed. And I'll, I'll show a map of that in a second. But just for those of you who aren't aware of the specifics, hey, Sarah. Uh, um, uh, Archaeology, you know, a, a typical definition is the study of the human past through the analysis of the things they left behind, of their material culture. And, um, and you know, artifacts are very cool and interesting and I love them, but they're only a means to understand the people that produce them. They aren't an end all and be all and, and, uh, and um, how they fit together in place and with each other and in, in the environment is, is really what the study of archaeology is. And um, I've been the state archaeologist for about uh, getting close to four years now. Um, the position was founded in 1975, but I'm only the second state archaeologist because my predecessor, Giovanna Peebles, was on the job for nearly 39 years. Um, and so um, I, I have long worked as an archaeologist in Vermont. But what I wanted to do was get some metrics when I came in. So this is about a year and a half old. I think we're over 6,000 sites now. But um, in total, uh, for the purposes of this map, when I made it uh, right around the beginning of the year 2016, um, there were 5,916 sites, of which uh, about 2,200 were Native American archaeological sites. The rest were historic uh, early foundations, cellar holes, um, underwater archaeological sites, uh, industrial sites. I don't know if any of you around here know Vic Rolando, um, but he's an industrial archaeologist that's really um, an incredible asset to us at the state of Vermont, really on his own dime and on his own initiative, spent much of the 70s, 80s, and 90s documenting um, the early uh, industry of Vermont, charcoal kilns, lime kilns, uh, iron furnaces, um, that are now largely subsumed by the forest, but were really important early industries for Vermont. And he published a book called 200 Years of Soot and Sweat, which is sort of our Bible. So many of those um, archaeological sites are represent represented in this as well. Um, 
But I produced a heat map of where the most documented archaeological sites that we have a, a critical mass of documentation for them to give them an archaeological site number. Um, and um, you can see where most of them fall out in the Champlain Basin, um, a little bit in southern Vermont in the, in the Bennington uh, Pownal area, and then a node in the southern Green Mountains um, that was documented by the Green Mountain National Forest. And this in no way reflects human or Native American land use, this is in fact where development has primarily occurred, um, at least in the modern era, because much of archaeology in Vermont, in fact almost all archaeology in Vermont is predicated upon uh, development, a big a bridge replacement or a road or um, you know, a big um, commercial development, those things that might trigger an archaeological review and, um, and then subsequent archaeological excavations and the finding of archaeological sites. And it's actually fairly rare that archaeology gets triggered in the grand scheme of federal and state permit review, but over the last 50 years or so there's been enough that we begin to, uh, to make some interesting syntheses with the data. Um, but you can see relatively um, very few along the Connecticut Riverside. And so um, it is one of our hopes, and in fact, you know, part of our reporting to the federal government, um, uh, every five years we have to come up with a state plan, a state historic preservation plan that outlines what we've done in the previous five years, where we are now, and what we'd like to do. And one of the things that I certainly um, advocated and was ultimately put in the plan, along with my um, archaeological colleagues at the Division for Historic Preservation, is to survey some of these eastern areas, um, you know, apart from development get some you know, um, private uh, public partnerships, you know, sponsor the archaeological societies, work with historical societies, and begin to do some of this survey. So hopefully we'll be able to do that in the next couple of years. So what I'm going to do is uh, spend the rest of this time going up, largely concentrating on the, on the Native American uh, timeline. But um, if we have time, show a little bit of a highlight of something uh, of the early um, historic period. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I would be lying if I said this wasn't somewhat of a highlight reel. Um, you know, this certainly doesn't uh, give you the full scope of what uh, archaeologists find on a yearly basis, but, but um, gives you some idea. And I, I did put in, uh, a, I think, two or three sites from the Connecticut River Valley, but, you know, um, you know, perhaps unfortunately, but whatever, most of them are from Addison, Chittenden, and, and Franklin counties. Um, so, uh, Native American presence in Vermont and in the Northeast uh, really began about 13,000 years ago, or perhaps just, just after that, 12,009, 12,008. And um, at that time, uh, the glaciers receded north of uh, Vermont around 13,400 years ago. Prior to that time, uh, you know, some of Vermont and you know, before, long before that, all of Vermont was covered in glacial ice. At the last glacial maximum, all the way down to Long Island, um, sometimes a mile or two thick. Uh, but by 13,400, they had all receded. And um, that meltwater had filled up the Champlain Basin with what's called Lake Vermont, which was confluent with another glacial lake that went all the way down to Long Island Sound. Um, that catastrophically burst around 13,200 years ago, draining you know, uh, the entire thing hundreds of feet in a matter of days that went out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, then Lake Albany and Lake Vermont separated and Lake Vermont filled up again and had filled up a huge swath of the, of, um, the, the Ontario lowlands and the Champlain Valley and, uh, and up into Quebec. Um, lake Hitchcock formed in this region, which is another huge glacial lake. And then right around 13,000 years ago, um, a, a glacial ice receded north of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and all of that um, glacial uh, meltwater uh, drained out into the St. Lawrence. But because there was the, glacial, uh, the weight of the glacial ice was so heavy, it had pressed the land down like a sponge. And so once all that meltwater had escaped, seawater came rushing in to the Champlain Basin, forming what we call the Champlain Sea. Um, and it was in existence in the Champlain Basin as an arm of the Atlantic Ocean for about 3,000 years, from roughly about 13,000 years ago to about 10,000 years ago. And um, prior to the glacial lakes I just described, which were largely barren, although some geologists have recently found um, uh, fish um, 
thin tracks in some of the clays. So it wasn't entirely dead like we thought, but nevertheless, not very biotically productive. The Champlain Sea uh, was very biotically productive, was much like uh, you know, the northern coast of Newfoundland or, or Labrador today, filled with marine mammals. Um, and for a publication I did a few years ago, that's still not in print, unfortunately, um, I got together all of the radiocarbon dated marine mammals uh, that, had, that had been dated in the sea, as far as I'm aware. And just to give you some of the names, harbor seal, bowhead whale, finback whale, ring seal, bearded seal, uh, white whale, walrus, narwhal, all of these remains have been found in Champlain Sea sediments, including um, uh, the uh, state fossil, um, this, uh, this beluga whale or white whale skeleton that was found in Charlotte, Vermont. Uh, in the uh, 1849. And um, usually when I give this talk, I, I say, um, you know, unfortunately they submerged it in, in horse glue when they pulled it out of the ground because that was a way to preserve it at the time. Um, they didn't have modern, you know, conservation techniques, so they just submerged the whole thing in horse glue so they could keep it together. And it worked because it's still there. But unfortunately, it makes radiocarbon dating, I thought, impossible because you've you've permeated it with this modern carbon so you can't date it but then uh, literally yesterday uh, a geologist from the University of Vermont said hey you might be interested in this and I scrolled down this long email chain and someone figured out a way to date it um, so uh, the radiocarbon date that came back is right around 13,000 years ago so really probably just at the initial impulse of the Champlain Sea so that's one date that is not in here that I'm very excited about. So all the way back to the 1950s, archaeologists have been debating, well, were these Paleo-Indians um, you know, really here when the Champlain Sea was here? And people went back and forth. And the consensus for, from about the 70s onward to only about 10 years ago was that the Champlain Sea had already come and gone by the time the first uh, Native Americans, these Paleo-Indian groups, came in. But then a lot of new research came out that began redating the Champlain Sea, stopped relying on shell dates that um, preserved a lot of old carbon in their shell matrix that they just pulled from the environment, and instead started dating bone and plant remains that they found in sediment cores. And all of these dates coalesced around this 13,000 year time frame as I was discussing, which then for me as an archeologist, me and a few colleagues said, well, hang on, we have great Paleo-Indian dates that go back to this 13,000 year time frame through 10,000 years. Uh, these are all Paleo-Indian uh, spear points uh, from Vermont. Most notable about Paleo-Indian spear points is this, is this really distinct channel that runs up the middle of them. It was very, very difficult to ex execute. Um, you know, some people might think that the oldest Native Americans might be the most quote unquote primitive, but that's absolutely not the case in the case of Paleo-Indians. They were the master lithic craftsmen of the entire archaeological record in the Northeast. They made the most refined stone tools. They needed the best quality material, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, and so all of a sudden it became you know, possible that Paleo-Indians were around at the same time as the sea. And then the question became, well, um, were they utilizing the landforms of the Champlain Sea? So some colleagues and I did some mapping. And we can just see through time, uh, Paleo-Indian sites in Vermont are still very rare, but there's about 28 uh, of them as of now. Um, beginning around, uh, you know, probably around 12,700, you can see this notable concentration of uh, Paleo-Indian archaeological sites right around where the Winooski River emptied into the Champlain Sea, which would have been like an estuary environment, very biotically productive. Um, one of the most important sites from that was found during the excavations for the uh, Chittenden County Circumferential Highway, which never got built, um, um, including um, this site in Williston called the Mahan site, which is one of the most important Paleo-Indian sites in the Northeast. Absolutely huge, um, but very thinly scattered. And, and long before we thought that this site was associated with the Champlain Sea, um, you know, the archaeologist that was responsible for doing it, the University of Vermont Consulting Archaeology Program, archaeologist Peter Thomas, thought that this represented a summer occupation because all of the materials weren't closely, densely in what would, we would thought would be shelters if you were in the winter, but rather they seemed to have no problem just expanding out upon this hillside and doing whatever they wanted outdoors. Um, here's just an excavation map 
you know, every one of those little, little tiny squares is a one by one meter square. So very, very large excavations. Um, and some notable things came out of it, uh, these Paleo Indian spear points, which were made out of local quartzite, which is remarkable because quartzite, while durable, is so difficult to work, and yet they worked it into these fine forms. But also, um, I'll get over here, uh, in the bottom right here, material from central Pennsylvania, um, all of this gray material uh, from the Hudson Valley, and then this red material from um, northern Maine, Monsungan Lake in northern Maine. Uh, a, a straight line distance between the furthest sources of Pennsylvania and Monsongan Lake of roughly 800 kilometers, all represented at this site in Williston. Um, really remarkable. Um, and, you know, other sites like this uh, spear point made out of Monsongan, Maine, that was found in Jericho recently. Um, and so just a, a close-up view here of, of where these sites were relative to the Champlain Sea shoreline uh, at, when, it, when the Winooski River ran in. And you can see they're essentially situating themselves out on this peninsula near to the sea. Uh, and then we go through time, more paleo Indian sites dated to the subsequent sub-period, about 12,200 to 11,600. Still, many of them associated with, uh, with these close shorelines of the Champlain Sea, um, including a recently discovered site that uh, appears to have been on an island uh, in uh, Ferrisburg. Um, and then going through time, you know, still sites, uh, including, uh, again, um, this Reagan site. By this time, it's not quite clear um, if the Champlain Sea, the sh because isostatic rebound or, the, or like this sponge-like effect, it started rising up again after the weight was pressed off of it. The Champlain Sea was slowly receding through time as, as things were rising. So it's not quite clear at this point, which is roughly, you know, 1,500 years after the Champlain Sea's existence, where the sea would have been relative to this landform. Although if it was still relatively high, this would have been another Paleo-Indian site on an island, although it gets more tenuous there. And then by um, this period, we can see that sites are starting to um, move into the formerly inundated landforms because the sea is emptying out and becoming Lake Champlain like we know it today, which is tough to see, but that's in the dark blue in the middle. And by the final Paleo-Indian period, they're definitely moving into these formerly inundated landforms. And probably only the river deltas of the Missisquoi, Lamoille, and Winooski are yet to have truly formed. Um, here's just a, a notable late Paleo-Indian site in Williston. Uh, or, I'm sorry, Colchester. So in aggregate, we can see that Paleo-Indians in the, in the uh, Champlain Basin um, seem to have preferred three locales. Um, areas near to the Champlain Sea, and in fact a large number of them and, and Im immediately adjacent to. Um, and, and just to go back, this really does suggest, although we haven't found you know, the spear point embedded in the whale skull, which I'm still looking for, I, I can't <laughs> wait for that, but this is really good you know, indirect evidence that Paleo-Indians were um, utilizing the resources of the Champlain Sea, that it was an attractant to them. They were probably hunting marine mammals or maybe gathering shellfish or you know, perhaps fishing with nets. And this really gives us a more nuanced view of Paleo-Indians rather than um, the traditional view of them as big game hunters going after caribou and mastodon and mammoth and, and all of the things which in other parts of uh, the continent they absolutely did. Um, and we have a number of Paleo-Indian sites that demonstrate that in the, in the High Plains, in the Southwest, in Canada. Um, but, but here, um, this, gives, this rounds out the view of Paleo-Indians as probably utilizing these resources. Um, Could I ask? Yeah. So how is it that you know by the location of the sites that, 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 that the sea was there at the time, or, or was its later uh, life as a lake? Yes, well, um, so uh, fortunately, uh, I have colleagues that are very smart geologists uh, <laughs> that work out this stuff. I actually did an early paper, well, 2012, where I calculated with quite rudimentary techniques where the Champlain Sea was all the way back in, actually, over a century ago, this, this gentleman, Woodward, um, mapped a rough estimate of the Champlain Sea based upon um, beachfronts 
basically seeing where the old beaches were. And he was pretty accurate. And then another gentleman came along in the late 1930s, uh, or um, Chapman in, in 1936, that produced a map that's almost as accurate as the ones that can be produced today at a, at a broad level. Um, because he went and mapped the beachfronts um, and calculated the isostatic rebound rate um, and, and saw where the sea would have been in a given area. And there's other evidence like where they found whales where, and, and where you find um, uh, marine shell, which is still quite common uh, in the Champlain Valley from that time period. Um, but now um, we can use computer technology to, to assist all of us. So you, know, you can use analytical models that say, um, fill the Champlain Basin up to this particular area with this amount of tilt and you get this shoreline. And so geologists have done this quite, you know, quite um, precisely. And with new LIDAR um, flying over Vermont, in fact, all of Vermont is almost done now, you can, you can map these things down to the meter. And so I, this recent model that I showed here is from a colleague of mine, George Springston at Norwich University, that we recently published an article about that on. Yeah. What's LIDAR? Yes, so LIDAR is light detection and ranging. And um, it, uh, there's terrestrial LIDAR where you can just set something up and shoot it at something like we just did with the Bellows Falls petroglyphs, where it will shoot out up to a million laser pulses a second. Um, and like radar or sonar or any of the other things that measure distance by calculating the time it takes for the beam to go to something and come back, and then the software interpolates that as a distance. So there's aerial LIDAR where you fly over um, an area with planes in grids, and they usually try to do it when the trees are down. And then, um, and then it maps the surface of the Earth, uh, you know, the, the newest LIDAR data, which is freely available if you have GIS software um, from Vermont Center for Geographic Information, um, uh, then translates that into a, a fine map. And when I mean fine, um, you can see farm fields, you can see individual, you know, plow furrows and, um, you know, uh, the doghouse uh, and, you know, little holes the size of this in the ground. It's, it's 10 centimeter resolution um, in, in the best cases. But the best thing for archaeology is that um, even if they fly over a forested area, and again, they try to do it when tree, you know, when the leaves are down, um, enough points get to the ground through the trees that there's software that runs and says, okay, well, we know this is the ground and everything, all the points that happen to hit the trees above that, we can then filter out. And so what you get is what's called bare earth LIDAR, where you're essentially looking at the landscape as if the trees weren't there. Mm -hmm. So you can see rock walls and, and cellar holes and you know anything else. Uh, you know, in my colleagues working in other parts of the world, um, you know, in the Mesoamerica, for instance, where it's all rainforest, and you know they're finding whole cities underneath underneath the forest canopy because you know this software just peels it off. You know, whereas before, you know, the analog way was taking a machete and taking your life in your hands and going through the jungle and hoping you, you know, hit something. Well, now you can begin to do this remotely, um, and uh, colleagues of mine in the Amazon are doing the same thing. Um, so it's really a boon for archaeology, but for any mapping purposes. And in this in instance, um, it allows you to map uh, contours um, really precisely. Um, so there's, there's that. And, and one more thing about the Champlain Sea in Vermont that's really interesting um, is that um, we, as New Englanders, uh, or Vermonters in New England, are the only landlocked New England state. And yet, because of rising sea levels since the Pleistocene, since you know, the last 10,000 years, um, all of the Paleo-Indian sites off the Atlantic um, are now inundated by rising sea levels. But because our um, land has risen faster and, uh, and actually drained the, the ocean out, all of our you know, shorelines are the only preserved above water now. So if there is evidence of Paleo-Indians along you know, these ocean margins, it's in Vermont and in in western or uh, eastern New York on the Champlain side, so it's it's a, it's a, a cool irony that I like to you know talk to my colleagues about a lot. Um, Paleo Indians also seem to have been uh, concentrated around areas where fresh water um, was located, so glacially formed ponds and wetlands. 
uh, Bristol Pond, Moncton Pond, uh, a lot of these areas were really uh, important. Um, and then travel corridors through the Green Mountains. And this, this gets me to uh, one of the last things I'll say about the Paleo-Indian period is uh, my colleagues John Crock and Weatherby Dorshow and I looked at this Mahan site as a good model to say, well, okay, well we have, um, you know, it's in Williston, Vermont, and we have sites that, um, that uh, or uh, raw, raw material sources, rock sources that go from central Pennsylvania up to Monsungan Lake. Um, so how would they have gotten from uh, those sources to Mahan or vice versa? And um, luckily, we can use very powerful software. Uh, my colleague Weatherby Dorshow has a, has a geographic information systems firm um, that does you know, world-class uh, analysis. And so he, um, we, we turned um, his powers on, on this thought process. We developed an elevation model, a flow model, uh, forest cover, what it would have been like you know, at this time period, uh, flow rate of rivers and streams, and a number of other criteria, and then said, okay, computer, calculate what would have been the easiest way for somebody to get from Mahan and Williston to Monsungan Lake in northern Maine. And when it came out, we were very, very surprised to see, but quite obviously when we thought about it in retrospect, that yeah, there's a couple interior routes that were okay, but by far and uh, the easiest route, which is the greenest, is to just go along the Champlain Sea and then cut in the Etchemin River, what's now the Etchemin River, and into the West Branch of the Penobscot, and then to Monsanto Lake. Suggesting to us that not only was the Champlain Sea perhaps important for resources, for food, um, but also it, it was likely a very important transportation corridor. And as the Paleo-Indian you know, period progresses, and certainly after the Paleo-Indian period, we don't see this, uh, this uh, chert, this raw material anymore. Perhaps because once the Champlain Sea stopped being available for travel, it became very difficult to walk through, you know, two mountain, big mountain chains and a variety of hills to get all the way to, you know, north central Maine. So it just stopped being accessible to the groups in Vermont. So really pretty interesting. Um, then moving on into what we call the Archaic Period. Um, uh, it's a broad sweep of time, about six and a half thousand years. Um, that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but um, things begin to get quite regional. Um, it's no longer is there this broad life way that's evidenced across, you know, really North America, but people start settling into their own environmental niches. Um, you know, and uh, spear points, you know, despite all the computing power and everything that we have now, uh, still the best advance for archaeology, the, the most fundamental advance has been radiocarbon dating, which has allowed us to um, put archaeological sites precisely in absolute chronology. Uh, you know, I'm so impressed by all of my um, predecessors that had no way to absolutely date things and just had to sort of, you know, guess and, you know, sandwich things in time and in space. Um, but in the absence of radiocarbon dating, we use things we call diagnostic artifacts. And one of the most important ones for us here in Vermont are spear points or, or arrowheads that we call projectile points. Because like you know, cars or cell phones or clothing, um, styles change through time, probably as a result of both technological innovation and then just style, wanting to change things up. Um, and we can date those changes you know, to about a 500, 800 year period throughout the Archaic period. Um, early Archaic period, uh, quite interesting. Uh, even 30 years ago, it was thought that in the far northeast here in Vermont, New Hampshire, parts of Maine, um, uh, Massachusetts even, uh, or particularly northern Massachusetts. Oops. Is that me? That's me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was me. All right, I'm not going to be embarrassed. Um, um, it was thought that there was a hollowing out of humans after the Paleo-Indian period and that uh, people abandoned part of the Northeast. And eventually, as more archaeology was done, it was found that that's not the case at all. Um, but still, some interesting things are going on. So in Vermont, uh, one of the most important sites uh, that was found quite a long time ago, uh, in 1980, in fact, uh, is the Johns Bridge site in Swanton, Vermont. And a suite of stone tools, including still some last vestiges of this red Monsungan shirt, are showing up. Uh, but now, you know, they're getting notched 
um, you know, sort of notch spear points, um, uh, using a different uh, spear technology probably with a spear thrower or atlatl. Um, uh, and um, these broad tabular knives that uh, were likely used for fish processing. And indeed, um, uh, Don's Bridge has the earliest um, fish bone documented a site in Vermont. This site was radiocarbon dated to about 9,000 years ago. And there's catfish bone and uh, one other one. Oh, it's escaping me right now. But there's, there's two species of fish that were found in this, suggesting that even though um, the rivers are still very dynamic, they're still cutting into their channels, uh, fish were returning to the rivers and that they were utilizing these resources. Also at this time, the forests were starting to reemerge. Still at this time, probably more boreal or coniferous forests, not a lot of uh, deciduous species, perhaps um, with the exception of birch, but, but um, getting more diverse than the Paleo-Indian period, which was very much more spruce, pine, parkland, uh, you know, um, not full tundra, but pretty sparse landscape. And, you know, parenthetically, um, uh, if you look at, if you go to the highest peaks in, in Vermont today, Mount Mansfield, Camel's Hump, Mount Abraham, um, and you look at the sides, if you look at the, you know, the valley floor where the mountains rise up, you can see the modern um, forest composition, mixed forest of deciduous and and species, quite a, a large variety of trees. And then you can see at around, you know, 17, 1800 feet, then it's all pine, you know, or coniferous trees going up pine spruce. Uh, and then at the very tops of those highest three, three uh, mountains, we still have preserved um, Pleistocene tundra conditions. So they're, they're very rare. And in fact, I think the one on Mans Mount Mansfield is gone now. It's not considered a distinct plant community because people have walked over it too much. But you're essentially going back in time as you're going up in elevation um, because the, the conditions are still so, you know, relatively cold up there that they can, they can maintain that, you know, Pleistocene uh, uh, biome or ecotone. So in the early archaic period, we have, you know, the more um, uh, uh, regular uh, sorts of spear points that we see in other parts of New England. But we also have in Vermont this thing that my colleague Jim Peterson found quite early on in Maine, which is that there are these sites like VTCH 490 in Essex, um, just showing a few excavation pictures, that have these sites, uh, these um, not too glamorous tools, which are these chunky quartz and occasionally quartz quartzite scraping tools. Um, very steep edges used for scraping something. Um, and these would be a one-off, except uh, sites dating to the early archaic, this eight to 9,000, and in some cases all the way back to, or all the way down to 7,000, occur all over Maine, uh, northern New Hampshire, and in Vermont. Uh, and we don't know what they were using for. Um, but, they're, but they're not a one-off. They occur in a lot of places. And where we find these, we don't find spear points. So there's various um, hypotheses about why this is. Um, some of my colleagues uh, once thought that it, they just weren't using spear points. They might have been using bone, um, bone points that don't preserve. Uh, now um, there's more of a consensus that these might have been used to process wood, and they're very just specific locations for wood processing. But they seem to have very much, this is just another site that contained these, uh, you know, going back to the early 90s. Um, you know, again, more of these in almost always quartz or quartzite. They seem to just really want that very hard, dense quartz material. And it's, it, this material is a bear to shape into anything. And practically its only attribute, uh, it, other than it being quite beautiful and, and lustrous, particularly crystal quartz, and that might have had some part to play in it, is that they're extremely hard. Quartz is very, very high up on the, on the hardness scale. Really only diamond and a couple of other things are, are harder than quartz. So perhaps that's the attribute that was attracting to them to this, but it's still up in the air. Um, and again, those two sites were found on the CCCH, and that's before and then after is the one section that was actually built in Essex, Vermont. Um, we're going to skip the middle archaic period because it's easy to skip because another uh, enigma of Vermont archaeology is there's almost no middle archaic sites, a whole 2,000 year span where um, we've only found about two professionally excavated archae um, middle archaic sites in Vermont. 
We're not sure why. Um, we, we do see a light scattering of them in big artifact collections that people have of the spear points dating to the Middle Archaic period, but we're really not sure what's going on. Um, uh, I don't think there's an abandonment of Vermont at this time, but you know, uh, by this time there's enough excavation to go on. In the 80s they said, oh, we'll find them, we're just not looking in the right spots yet. But by 2017, there is something weird that we're not finding the sites here, and, and, the, and the explanations are not readily forthcoming. Um, but by the, by the late archaic period, um, temperatures, global temperatures rise just a bit, but it's enough that deciduous tree species begin to move up into Vermont. There's a greater variety of, uh, of um, uh, you know, pr um, procurable um, plants, medicines, tree species, and populations <coughs> boom. Beginning around 6,000 years ago, we see many uh, late archaic archaeological <coughs> sites emerge. And I'm not going to go through all the various time periods and everything, but, but you know, from the mountaintops to the valley floors, um, you know, late archaic sites are very common indeed. Um, I'll just skip this. This is a, a, a neat site in Essex, Vermont, dating to the end of the archaic period. Um, and you know, this was pre-drone. Um, this was the cutting edge. This was uh, my, my friend uh, and colleague, Kate Kenny, got this thing online that we thought was the greatest thing since sliced bread. It was a, she called it a shot stick. And it was like this metal pole <laughs> that you went up like 20 feet with and it had a little camera that looked in the viewfinder and then a trigger. And so she'd be like this and like, you know, if it was windy, forget it, you know, but, but it took good, you know, aerial photos of this. Now with a, you know, a, a drone you can get at, you know, the, the convenience store it gets better images than this, but back in the early 2000s, this was uh, this was it. Um, and just you know, remarkable um, features and fire pits, roasting pits. We found a lot of nut remains here, suggesting that they were processing nuts. Um, Do you know what kind? Yeah, um, in, in here, uh, hickory and butternut, I think, but. Um, one of the big initiatives that I'm actually doing with uh, my, my colleague um, and Heritage Center employee, Brett Ostrom, is going through, I, one of the initiatives I did when I became state archeologist was um, with uh, a, another former temporary employee, Tabor Morrill, um, and, and several other colleagues, go through every archeological report that's been generated since we started doing archeology span in Vermont. Um, and that's a requirement of doing consulting archaeology in Vermont. You produce a final report with a good analysis of the remains that you've excavated out. And many of them had radiocarbon dates. Not, certainly not all of them. It depends upon the, the importance of the site and, and uh, how big it was. But um, ultimately, I went through every report. And um, there's a total of, I think, 362 radiocarbon dated archaeological sites in Vermont. Or, radiocarbon dates. Some of those were multiple sites from the same site. So that was a very important data set, and that's freely available online. I put that on uh, the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation's website, and various people have downloaded it and used it as a resource. But then the next thing was like, okay, well, now we have all of this information about food remains that have been analyzed over 9,000 years. So now I'm working with Brett to, and several other folks to go through all the reports and document every occurrence of um, plant or animal food remains. That's a much bigger lift. So it's going to take a couple of years. But at the end, we're going to have this remarkable data set of what people have been eating in Vermont over 9,000 years. Um, and and th the further we get in the timeline, you know, the more sites we have and the more nuanced data we can have. But the reason I bring that up is because um, one of the things I've noticed, and this might change after we go through it all, but we have, in aggregate, hickory, butternut, beech nut, acorn, uh, what's the other nut I'm missing? Walnut. Um, but I've never once seen a chestnut in a, from any time period in Vermont. And in southern New England, chestnut flour was, you know, that was the main staple for Native Americans. Uh, and, and it's, you know, extensively written about in historic, um, you know, chronicles. I haven't seen one chestnut remained up here. And in fact, I'm now going through to the data to see if there's any chestnut wood that's been um, uh, identified in you know, fire pits. 
to even see if the trees were up here because you know this might be one of the things that gets out of here is chestnut was quite rare um, up here you know so yeah so more beech nut butternut very very common uh, butternut in particular is you know um, I think acorn might be the most common but butternut is certainly a close second but when we tabulate all this I'll be able to tell you all these things oh, you know good. so stay tuned, stay tuned. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, uh, we found this uh, part, it's cracked, so you're only seeing a little bit of it, and you can see the drill holes uh, in the middle there, and this would have been sort of an oblong um, gorget or, um, you know, piece that would have, uh, there would have been, you know, a, a textile or, or hide thong that would have gone through. But the neatest thing about this was you can see the drill holes, and you can see that the drill hole in the bottom cracked it, and you can almost imagine someone just getting so mad and throwing it. Um, but right next to it, we found the drill, and, um, and uh, it fit perfectly into the drill holes. So that was pretty neat. Um, but I'm just going to go on through here because I'm, I'm ch j jabbering away. Uh, the Shelburne Pond area is another area with a lot of archaeological uh, importance. All those red dots are archaeological sites. Um, various work has been done over there during the years. But what I wanted to highlight was the largest artifact we currently have um, displayed at the Vermont Archaeology Heritage Center in Barrie, which is where I work two days a week. It's a curation facility and, and uh, museum and research space, is a dugout canoe that um, was found there in 1979. Um, dugout canoes were uh, very important for Native Americans, and um, it, birch bark canoes didn't replace them. Birch bark canoes were just another technology that they used. Birch bark canoes were very light, and you could portage and go long distances on them, but they were somewhat um, you know, more fragile uh, and uh, couldn't carry as heavy loads. Dugout canoes, which were made by taking a large log and essentially building a fire on the top while keeping the sides wet, and then keeping the fire going and chipping out the char until you hollowed it out, were extremely sturdy. And you could stand up in them and, and um, you know, uh, spearfish or bow and arrow fish or cast nets or do whatever you wanted. The problem you might imagine with them is they're a giant tree trunk. So they're very, very heavy. So what they would do, uh, what they usually do at the end of a season, was sink them with stones, weigh them down with stones, and then come back the next year, float them, dry them, and use them again. But occasionally, for whatever reason, uh, they, the memory was lost of where they were. They couldn't come back because of something. They stayed underneath uh, the water. And in fact, we know of three um, dugout canoes from Shelburne Pond. This one is, is in the Heritage Center. We know of other, a dozen dugout canoes in various lakes around Vermont, including one that uh, we believe um, is still weighed down with the rocks. It, it's still you know, like it was. And certainly in, in um, Massachusetts, they found a number of those in, in lakes um, that are still weighed down with rocks. Yeah? What's the wood? White pine. In fact, uh, I can't say definitively, but I think the three from um, Shelburne Pond were all white pine, um, and it was a it was um, buoyant, fairly sturdy, and fairly easy to work. You know, if you tried to make one of these out of oak or something, you know, the Native American would probably still be working on it. You know, um, so it, it had a good you know uh, range of of qualities. What's the time period? Ah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that was radiocarbon dated to uh, 1500 AD, so just prior to European contact in this region. So then we get to this last period, the woodland period, uh, you know, a period that you know, we define as roughly 3,000 years ago to the time of European contact. And some really interesting things went on uh, in the woodland period. Um, the early woodland period, after this sort of late archaic fluorescence of, of, uh, of, of um, you know, groups and population sizes, at least if numbers and sizes of sites can be used as a proxy for that, uh, begin to dip. Um, and uh, sites in the early woodland period are fewer, um, and the site sizes are generally smaller. And we're not sure why. Um, I have hypothesized that it might be an environmental downturn. Things get wetter um, and a little bit more um, uh, difficult to negotiate different resource patches. There might have been social factors. Um, some people in other regions have hypothesized that disease might have been somewhat of a factor. We do know that some of the earliest tuberculosis in uh, the New World dates to around this time period. Um, um, 
including a tentative tuberculosis diagnosis of a Native American burial in Isle of Mott from this time. Um, so, you know, various factors might have been at play. Um, Conversely, I won't show any images here, uh, you know, out of respect to the Abnaki, but this was, a, this was also a time, conversely, while site sizes were getting smaller and less in number, um, Native American cemeteries become very large and complex with grave goods from um, copper from the Great Lakes and shell from uh, the Mid-Atlantic and the Gulf Coast and, um, you know, these, these stones for making stone tools from Indiana and Labrador. So uh, while there seems to have been potentially a crisis, um, ritual elaboration is becoming increasing, which aren't necessarily antithetical. You know, people often turn to religion or cosmology in sort of times of crisis, and that, you know, that's at least what I contend we might be seeing here. Yeah, did you have it? Uh, the time period again? Yeah, this is the early woodland period, so from about 3,000 years ago to about 2,100 years ago. Are you, are you implying by discussing all of the things that were at the grave sites? coming from other places that there was some kind of trade network. Trade network, yes, broad trade networks. And Sounds certainly, like yeah, and certainly in other areas. Um, this is the same time um, that in other, like the Ohio Valley, um, the, the first mound building um, groups arise that we call the Adena. Um, and they're all trading with, it, with one another. Um, so, so yes, I mean, essentially, um, these groups are an extension of this Adena mound building um, phenomenon. Although, how much knowledge they actually had of what was going on down there is somewhat, they wanted or they, they, um, they traded in the items, but I would argue that they reinterpreted them in locally. It wasn't like it was a broadly shared religion or cosmology, it was more the items that they wanted. Um, yeah? In terms of that kind of trade network, um, I was, were most of these dugout boats found in ponds or small lakes and were the good what would have been used for the long range? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, we do not know if birch bark canoes existed at this time period, if the technology was there. Um, there have been dugout canoes um, that have been found in other parts of, uh, of the Northeast, Mid Atlantic, and Southeast that date to, you know, all the way back to five or 6,000 years ago. Um, so, it's interesting, there's a remarkable article that someone did where he, you know, calculated the carrying capacity of one of the, you know, an average size dugout at load and what it would take for two people to carry it if it was full of stone this many kilometers. And the limit is roughly about 200 kilometers. And then you'd have to, you know, resupply, um, you know, portaging would be very difficult. Um, and so uh, this scholar, um, really thought about, you know, that it would have been a multi-stage process. You'd go to perhaps 200 kilometers to the limit of your, you know, what you could do logistically, hand it off to another group who would then go on the other 200 kilometers. But there's other people that have, you know, um, uh, hypothesized that there might have been a trade fair model where um, certain important people in different groups from across the eastern woodlands would once a year, once every five years, or, you know, once you know, however they, you know, mark time, say we're all going to come together at this place and trade amongst ourselves. And there's some analogs for that as well, and then just bring home what they acquired back to their home villages. I don't tend to, to buy that, but, um, you know, there's certain people that do. Uh, and then the one I intend to uh, subscribe to is that there's, you know, what we call down-the-line trade, so, so, you know, from source, through a series of intermediaries to the end line recipient, but that these exchange relationships were um, preserved. So you didn't, you didn't get or necessarily even want everything that was circulating broadly throughout the Eastern Woodlands. You had a few things that um, th these relationships were curated over generations and even centuries that you traded with this person every so often and they brought things in from this and, and perhaps you had a few of those relationships in any given community um, and the, the analog is the, the Huron, who very much curated trade relationships. And once you had established a relationship with them, it was meant to be passed on to your son and your son's son, and you weren't supposed to break them. They were, they were you know, they were meant to last. Um, so, but it's still up in the air. I'm not the final word on that by any, any means. Um, but after, beginning with the early woodland period, again, these population declines, ritual elaboration, um, it is also the time when um, 
Native Americans began to produce pottery in the Northeast. And, and in other parts of the world and more traditional views, pottery is, is part and parcel with the development of agriculture. That pottery is a means to um, process and store and, um, and um, you know, transport uh, agricultural surpluses. But we see pottery being um, utilized 2,000 years prior to really the introduction of sustained um, agriculture here in the Northeast. Um, this pot uh, was found uh, 50 feet uh, off of Thompson's Point in Charlotte in Lake Champlain and just gives you an idea of the typical stylistic motifs of um, this early, this next period, the, the Middle Woodland period. Um, quite elaborate for Vermont uh, with a variety of decorative motifs. And interestingly, um, even though you know, organic materials rarely preserve in uh, Vermont archaeological sites if they're not burned, um, uh, Native Americans in the Northeast would often impress um, fabric into their, the outside of their pots to drive air bubbles out of them so they would fire more readily. And that's a boon to archaeologists because then we can take clay and, and um, press it into the fired pot and then get the negative impression of, um, of the textile. So even though no textile is preserved, you can see on the right here um, what clay impressions would be like. We can reconstruct um, their, their um, you know, weaving patterns, the warp and weft and, and, uh, and the different weaving patterns that they utilized. And, there, and you know, there's certain archeologists that um, you know, do this a lot and, uh, and you know, have d documented in aggregate a great variety of stylistic motifs um, that have gone through where they switch from using um, you know, a particular nodding and warp and weft pattern to another one, um, where they um, switch from uh, basswood to likely something like milkweed, um, where they use animal hair. So you know, even though we're only getting these little windows, we can imagine uh, or hypothesize that they have very complex you know, multifaceted garments using a variety of um, you know, textile uh, techniques. Some other of these. Um, so a very notable uh, site along the Connecticut, dating to this early and middle woodland period, um, is in was found in Canaan, Vermont, in the late 1980s, uh, uncleverly called the Canaan Bridge site, uh, because it was going to be um, you know uh, destroyed for the redevelop or the rebuilding of the of the Canaan Bridge, uh, and really remarkable. Um, uh, set of fire hearths, uh, storage pits, and general, general living area dated to this uh, early and then into the middle woodland period. Again, another one of these sites where a large variety of nut remains, burned nut remains were found. So this was probably a nut harvesting and processing area. Uh, fish were also found here. Obviously, the Connecticut River would have been an important fish research, resource. Um, another area, um, where am I here? Let's see. Um, another area, uh, slightly downriver in Newport, um, had another uh, um, archaeological site called the Carson Farm site that um, deeply buried strata in the alluvial floodplain, but preserved another one of these early woodland sites. And some of this um, earliest pottery that we call Vinette One pottery was found there. And uh, I mention this only because recently a colleague of mine, Corinne Taché from Queens College, um, has been doing a survey of these earliest ceramic vessels in the Northeast, um, getting samples from them. And I provided a sample from Carson Farm and actually taking microscopic or you know, pinprick sized samples of that, running it through a series of uh, machines and actually determining um, what people were cooking in the pots. And so she was able to determine that um, the pot, at least in the most recent few meals before it was buried, was used to cook fish. Um, and, um, and so it's a really remarkable series of techniques that were used to get this. And, and you know, I often say that archaeology is a slow science when, you know, the excavators in 1985 when they excavated this, they probably couldn't have even imagined that that was possible. And that's why curation and proper conservation is so important because these were sitting in climate controlled conditions for someone to come up with this idea and propose it to me and say, hey, we've got the material, here we go. And, and knowing exactly where it came from and what conditions it came from so she can rule out the false, false positives that might be there. And, and so um, you know, part of what we're doing is, yes, 
um, saving things that might be destroyed in many cases, but also curating for the future when things that we um, don't, can't even imagine are possible yet are all of a sudden possible. And the other part of that, obviously, is that as a state archaeologist, something doesn't have to be destroyed. If we can work with people to say, hey, can we just you know, avoid this section? Or uh, you know, can you make this green space rather than that green space? And oftentimes, people will say, yeah, that's fine. Preservation is, is probably the most important thing we have because you know, 100 years ago, you know, there was a lot of hubris in archaeology. People always thought they were doing the cutting edge, the best and the, you know, the greatest. And we, we don't have that, or most of us don't have that anymore, um, where we know that in 50, 100 years, the technology's coming where you can probably wave some electronic device over the ground and know exactly where everything is and what it is without ever sticking a shovel in the ground. And that's a little bit sad to me as a dirt archaeologist, but also very important. Um, and, and so to preserve the sites intact in the ground for that time that will inevitably come uh, is, is something that we need to be cognizant of here in the present. Yeah. Well, that was the very question that I had on my mind was when in a dig like that where you, what you find is so far below the surface, how did you decide to dig that hole in that particular spot? Um, yeah, so I'll, I, you know, I could give you the very technical answer and that it's a multi-pronged, uh, you know, statistical thing about proximity to water and all this stuff, but really it's, you know, it's intuition. You know, largely what I say is, and we do have a predictive model that actually breaks these things down in, and it, 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 it accurately predicts the locations of archaeological sites with a, with a, with a high degree of specificity. Um, but it's not perfect, but, um, but um, it really, when I say it's intuitive, it's basically me saying to you, where would you like to camp? You know, uh, you don't want to camp on a hillside. You don't want to camp, you know, uh, hundreds of, uh, you know, yards away from the river, you know, because you're going to be, you know, you're going to lose your water through perspiration by the time you get it back to your campsite. Um, you know, you want to be somewhere where there's, you know, adequate um, food resources and all these other things. And those are the things that, yes, we calculate and, and run statistics on, but really, you know, that's important, you know, is, is, is just where would people have liked to have camped for a day, a week, you know. Um, but there are some, you know, non-intuitive things that doing archaeology over, or less intuitive things that doing archaeology over 40 years have informed us, like the importance of wetlands, even sort of minor wetlands appear to have been quite attracti an attractive feature for Native American groups. That, you know, we would have thought that, well, you know, yeah, maybe, but, but you know, are they really as important as streams and major rivers? Almost, it seems like, you know. And so that, you know, there is a, is a learning curve, and there are things that we learn through time. But obviously, the Connecticut River, you know, it's, it's a, it's a no-brainer, so to speak, you know. Um, uh, Well, I mean, they are resource nodes, even for lower order things like frogs and, you know, certainly waterfowl and, um, and you know, fish. Um, but also, um, they're very biotically diverse with um, medicinal plants, uh, food remains, cattails, um, all of these things that, you know, we might overlook, but that supplied a lot of um, resource base. You know, um, I took a canoe ride up the Missisquoi River um, last year to do a, some survey along some bank erosion uh, there. And to see the, um, the arrowhead route along the banks, you know, in this swamp, which, you know, we don't even think about anymore, but was a, it was a staple. You know, they would take the tuber and, 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 um, and, and uh, process it in ovens. And it was, you know, it was a staple food. And it was everywhere. And those are the kind of things you find in these environments. Um, Man, I'm nowhere near. So I'm just going to cycle through here. I can talk all night. Um, you know, um, other uh, pot um, from the Swanton area that, again, it's difficult to see. This is a cast because this was found immediately adjacent to one of these um, early woodland uh, Native American cemeteries. Um, and so uh, we didn't photograph the original, but we, they, uh, the Abnaki did allow us to make a cast before they reburied it. And interestingly, this pot was probably made you know, we don't have an exact date, but made after the cemetery had stopped being used by several hundred years. And yet it appears that someone came, took this pot, um, ritually buried it, 
you know, just on the outskirts of the cemetery and then left it. So we can see that you know, the, the, the cemetery was still in the minds of people you know, half a millennium or so after the site was abandoned and was still considered a place of ritual importance and that offerings were being left there, um, at least as far as we can discern. Okay, so let's get to the late woodland period and I'll try to speed it up here, but this was the time, finally, around this time, where, um, where uh, corn, bean, squash agriculture began to be developed in Vermont. And it did change things quite radically. Native Americans moved into larger village spaces. Um, they, um, at least, uh, you know, two or three seasons. Uh, population sizes at archaeological sites become bigger, particularly along floodplains, non-winter archaeological sites. And obviously, you know, corn becomes central in importance. Um, one of the biggest excavations that's gone on in the last 30 years recently occurred in the, in the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge in an adjacent private land for the upcoming um, expansion of Route 78 up there. And um, this site was remarkable and was in the Winooski River, or um, I'm sorry, the Missisquoi River floodplain. And floodplains are really important archaeological sites because they preserve things sequentially. So, you know, 6,000 years ago, a Native American group would live in a particular area, leave, then a, the site would then flood sometime later, cap it with a layer of sterile soil, then another Native American group would come sometime later, live, deposit their artifacts and refuse, it would cap again. And so what you get over millennia is this layer cake-like effect where you can essentially go back down in time as you go deeper. And the preservation here was absolutely remarkable. So the woman who is uh, pointing there is at a, is at a uh, pointing at a, uh, the remains of a fire hearth that dates to the late archaic period, probably 4,000 years ago. Uh, I, I don't recall the exact date. And then all those sort of dark lines, you know, or bands that you can see in the soil above that are subsequent or more recent Native American deposits all the way up, some very large. Um, so this is uh, one of these early woodland um, spear points from about 3,000 years ago. I think, um, let's see, let me see, maybe oh, I missed it. But anyway, I'm just going to scroll through. A variety of radiocarbon dates were run here. Um, and you, again, you can see those black bands and another excavation unit going all the way down. Um, you know, this was all of their areas of testing remarkable um, large. And um, what they noticed was that um, there's a tiny middle archaic presence, again, the six to 8,000. Um, but late archaic was well back um, from the delta towards you know, the main Swanton area. And then through time, Native Americans were going further and further out in the delta, probably as the landform stabilized. Um, and, and so by the late woodland period, you can see that's in the light green. They're just moving way out, and sites are becoming increasingly larger and more intense um, than processing. This um, is a late uh, woodland midden. So all those little bands are actually from the same time period. And what you're seeing um, is it's a, it's a dump. And, and um, they're throwing things, what was then probably, over the bank. And so you, you know, it might have been a dump to them, but for us it's an absolute boom uh, for preservation because it preserves you know, um, all of you know, the food and refuse remains that are so important to us. Um, this deep, deep middle archaic feature uh, that they dated. I'm just going through it quickly. Again, you know, further sites. Oh, this site was, abs or this feature was absolutely remarkable. And you can see the, the radiocarbon dates were between 3870 and four, you know, so between 3,800 and 4,000 years ago. And I believe that this is the feature when they first excavated into it um, they were immediately like, whoa, because it still smelled like fish. And um, they found fish bone in it. Um, just other, you know, remarkable preservation. And I'm scrolling through here, early woodland. Where is my thing? Um, more sites. Okay, come on. The late woodland. Can I ask you something about the baskets? Just yeah, sure. The pots are sort of yeah. quizzing over them, but they have patterns on them. Are those patterns in size? Do, do they represent baskets in which the place No, they're in size. They're, they're always incised. Or again, if there's fabric paddling on them, there's, there's um, 
they're paddled with uh, with fabric, but they're, the pots were already made. They weren't made inside baskets. But it's interesting you say that because um, uh, archaeologists down at Jamestown, William Kelso, um, when they recently found Jamestown, and it's absolutely remarkable, he's documented that you know the people of Jamestown were utterly desperate. They were they were starving, and they needed stuff to trade with the Native Americans in the region. And he's documented that they saw this sort of fabric paddling on the outside of the of the of the um, Native American pottery vessels down there, and so to tr they tried to make them to trade with the Native Americans, and they did try to make them. They said, "Oh, they must make them in baskets because you can see all this basketry." So they would jam, you know, pottery on the on the inside of the baskets, and then put it in the fire, and it, you know, it didn't work at all. And they were like, "Ah, oh, you know," and yeah. as they're starving. Um, <laughs> um, so one of the most important things. Uh, well, there's a million important things, cool things that came out of this, but. Um, the first remains, and it's difficult to see, and so I'll show you here, is uh, the first definitive longhouse structure, late woodland longhouse structure. And so um, this is what I wanted to get to because this took me a while, but uh, I'll show you here. Um, so you can see, you might be able to see an outline, but there, that's what the outline of the posts is, and that's where a fire hearth is, and boom. Then, you know, I'm taking a little liberties, but um, you can imagine that this is what it would look like, covered in bark. And then, um, you know, as you go through, this is the reconstruction of, you know, roughly what this longhouse would have looked like. Low-lying, um, you know, bed platforms, fires in the middle, um, and uh, not the entire thing was excavated. In, in fact, all of this was only um, excavated down to reveal the patterning at the subsoil. Um, and, uh, and in fact, when you, when you can see this removed, you can again see the lines of post molds and trenches where the outside went. Um, and all of that is still preserved. They covered it with plastic and then reburied it. So because it was on federal land, um, you know, uh, they decided to preserve it in place. So all of that is still there. Um, we took a couple um, or, you know, the consultancy, the Northeast Archaeology Research Center, took a couple samples out of the fire pits, but otherwise left it intact. And, um, yeah, well, it's 810. So, um, you, you sure? <laughs> well, I could, I could keep going, but um, let me, I will stop there um, and just say um, that, uh, you know, I'll have to come back another time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it's a remarkably diverse, um, you know, archaeological record uh, that documents really culturally dynamic, um, you know, fully formed human beings. You all know this, uh, but Native Americans over 13,000 years that didn't stop being here, you know, when Europeans came that are, that are still here. Um, and that, you know, despite, you know, it's easy to gloss over that, okay, Native Americans, they were hunter-gatherers, but actually there's a really dynamic record of, of them utilizing the resources living here over 13,000 years. And then I do not want to give short shrift um, to the historic archaeological record, which, you know, Vermont's a really unique place. Um, it, uh, you know, when I give talks on historic archaeology, even into the 1750s, the maps would say, you know, would have the Champlain Valley, which was then still French, you know, and there'd have a few things, you know, French settlements and French forts, Fort St. Frederick, you know. And then there was, you know, down in this area where um, there was the English settlement, you know, Fort Number Four, Fort Dummer, you know, um, uh, Fort Bridgman, all of these things. But then in the middle, you know, this map just said uncharted wilderness belonging to the crown. You know, we were real, um, we were really frontier quite late. And so, you know, the historic archeological remnants are really interesting in that aspect, um, and and uh, and so you know certainly you know if and when I come back I can you know talk about that as well. Um, so uh, you know I'm sorry if I kept you over an hour, but I appreciate it, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah. How can when you're wandering through the woods and you find something, how do you know if it's significant or if it's just a pile of rocks? Well, um, I would say uh, that. Um, you know, significant is a, is, a, is a multifaceted term in archaeology because archaeologists, particularly in regulatory contexts like I work in, um, significance is a formal term that defines whether or not it, sh it is eligible for listing on the National Register. 
but significant to you or significant to the body of knowledge that we collect in Vermont is a whole different story. And I would say, you know, almost everything is worthy of recordation and at least say, hey, I found this. This is where the location is. I took one picture. You know, we collect that data all the time. It's, and it's all important to us and it all fills out the story. And yes, I do get, you know, quite regularly uh, people that, you know, send me emails and say, you know, I found this, you know, amazing thing and it's just a stone. And I, you know, feel bad telling them that. But <laughs> nevertheless, that's, that's part of my job. Um, you know, or the person long ago who said they found an Indian pillow and it was really just some quick creep that had dried in, in the river <laughs> and looked like, a, you know. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, very often, you know, people will um, contact me and say, is this anything? And, you know, my eyes, you know, almost shoot out of my head. And all I would say is, um, you know, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. I would rather have you, you know, particularly historic archaeological remains, if you find them in the forest and you have access to a GPS or even a, an iPhone that records a location now when you take a photo, that would be great and we'd want to know about it. We might have already documented it in our databases. Maybe we haven't. And even so, it'd be great to get a photo. And, you know, part of our job, part of my job as a state archaeologist is to not just say, okay, thank you, but, you know, if you're interested to try to do a little research and tell you if we know anything about it or, you know, to, to share the knowledge that we've accumulated um, for all of you. I mean, that's, you know, part of, that's a large part of what I'm doing this for is to preserve and disperse, you know, this really cool and important knowledge about our past as, uh, as Vermonters, you know. Um, so, yeah, there's that, you know, and I, um, you know, don't, encourage digging you know on your own um, uh, because it is just an you know even the best archaeologists in the world it's always inherently destructive and um, and um, you know so it's always good to to do things um, you know with professionals and then you know with a plan so many people love to dig but then once the things are out of the ground you know it's sort of like now what and 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 you know archaeologists always say for every you know, day in the field, there's typically four in the lab. And then, and then, you know, again, this importance of curation. And then someone has to then, if you're going to be honest and ethical about it, someone's then going to curate that in perpetuity, you know. So it, it isn't something to be, you know, entered into lightly. Um, having said that, you know, we do try to make available as much as I possibly can, you know, um, excavations that people can get involved with and come and do. Um, and I would never tell, you know, a farmer not to walk in his field and collect, you know, arrowheads. That's his right. It's his property. But I would, you know, ask, um, hey, if you have a collection of arrowheads, and particularly if you know where they came from, um, you know, sh share that with me. I don't want them. I'm not going to come and take them, but I would love to photo them and, you know, maybe find out where you found them. Um, you know, and, and that information is really great, you know. And, and um, you know, I, I often say to students that I teach that, you know, um, you know that you've become a real archaeologist when the artifacts stop being something on their own and just be a means to convey information. So that now I'm quite happy with a, <coughs> with a photograph or a 3D scan as much as I am with the artifact itself, you know. It's, it, 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 an artifact is only a means for information potential. Um, and, uh, and so, um, you know, I, in as much as, you know, I can get some information from people without, you know, unduly burdening them or anything. And I have to say, and, you know, Vermonters are wonderful. Most are quite willing to just, you know, you know say, hey, this is great. And, and then in return, I can give them some knowledge if I, if I have it about what it is, when it dates to, you know, how it might contribute to our knowledge base. And so, yeah, um, it's a long way around to saying I'm interested. <laughs> yeah. Can you say something about burials? Yeah, I mean, um, apart from these early woodland, you know, 3,000 to 2,100 year old burial sites, they're actually very, very rare in Vermont. In the 14 years that I um, did uh, archaeology, field archaeology, before I became a state archaeologist, and, and uh, I'm largely, you know, I've largely hung up my shovel and trowel now. Um, you know, perhaps that'll change in the future if we do some of these more, you know, survey 
digs, but um, I never encountered one. Historic burials quite often, not often, but you know, often enough. Um, but we do know that they are encountered. They're, they're often isolated. Um, there's been a number of them reported along the Connecticut. And obviously they're very sensitive and, and sacred to um, the Native Americans and, and, um, and uh, you know, to us as humans. Uh, and prior to 2012, um, there was actually no law in Vermont about um, disturbing unmarked human remains. If they were in a cemetery, there was big penalties. You couldn't just go and dig up a, a grave in a cemetery. But if it was unmarked, meaning you know you you were digging in your garden, or you know you saw a, a, you know human remains eroding out of a bank, you could keep them. Um, and we were sort of late to the game. Most other states had an unmarked burial law, and we did not. So in 2012, we did, we we put forth unmarked burial um, legislation. So now that is the one thing that even if it's on your private property, it's not inherently yours. Um, it, it, if you encounter an unmarked burial, there's a procedure to first call the medical examiner to make sure that it's not, you know, more recent nefarious <laughs> activity. And then if the medical examiner determines that it's historic and not the result of a crime, then um, I will be called and, 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 and um, we will determine, you know, proper um, remediation of it. Um, you know, it might be that, you know, you as the landowner might say, well, it's fine there, I just won't, you know, dig in this area and I'll leave it alone and that might be fine. You might say, no, I need to put a swimming pool in or whatever. And, and in that case, there is a fund that the state has, uh, you know, it's not overly large, but um, it's a fund that we can leverage to properly excavate, remove, and then reinter somewhere else uh, uh, unmarked human remains. Um, and, and, you know, one of the biggest, um, the, how this came about was not Native American human remains, but actually you might have heard about the War of 1812 soldiers on the North Street in Burlington, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, much of the old North End of Burlington was built over the War of 1812 cemetery. And, um, you know, when they were redoing and upgrading the North, you know, the main thoroughfare North Street in the old North End, um, you know, the conscientious construction workers found you know, human remains stopped. We came down and we said, well, you know, here's some military buttons. And then quickly our, my, you know, crack colleague, Kate Kenny said, I think these are War of 1812. And then I think there was a big cemetery. And ultimately we came out with 20 human remains just from that one project. And so we don't want any landowner to, you know, be in the position of you know, feeling like they need to foot the bill, you know, so there's this fund to help, you know, just come in, remove them, and then reinter them appropriately. Um, and so, you know, and, and we're still working on all that. But, you know, now um, all burials, whether in a formal cemetery with a headstone, without a headstone, are, you know, are considered properly, you know, um, uh, important and sacred and not property, you know, that they should be dealt with accordingly. Yeah? Could you speak a little bit more about the habitation in this part of the state, uh, along the West River, the Connecticut, anywhere else? Yeah, West River, Connecticut, I mean, super dense um, area of Native American activity. We know that um, historically, I mean, the, the historic chronicles about, you know, this being a real nexus of the Sokoki and, um, and other Native American groups coming up and down the Connecticut and up the West, um, extremely important, except, um, but archeologically, uh, with a few exceptions, we just don't have a lot of professionally excavated archaeological sites in this region. We have a number of sites documented, but they're mostly collector sites where, you know, um, people will say, oh, I found this or I found that, you know, um, and we, we document it and we, you know, give it a site number. But w the, what we can say from those little windows into, you know, um, archaeological sites is, is relatively little. Um, you know, there's been a few important excavations. The Skichewag site in Windsor along the Connecticut River has been important. Um, but that is really, you know, the only major uh, archaeological excavation on the Connecticut uh, in Vermont, other than the Canaan Bridge site that I, I talked about as well. So it's, 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 it's remarkably sparse. Um, but in some ways, it's, it's also... Um, preserved because a lot of it is farmland, although subject to erosion. Um, you know. Yeah? What did you find down in Vernon? Wasn't there an excavation in Vernon? Oh, uh, Vernon. Well, 
I mean, there's a number of sites known in Vernon, including um, you know uh, several important sites, but there wasn't a recent excavation in Vernon, I don't think. Um, I mean, there was, there was, I know of a number of excavations there. I just don't know if they found anything really, um, you know, yeah. major. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, sort of major archaeological sites. Um, Why don't we find anything along the Connecticut River here? It's you would. Because we haven't looked. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm saying that with all due responsibility. Don't go looting for, you know, uh, archaeological sites. But, I, I also uh, noticed that I don't see a lot of arrowheads being found out here in the field. Well. That's another interesting thing. Um, there has been some archaeological work done recently, um, just preliminary work um, for the TransCanada relicensing. And what we're finding is that um, arrowheads or spear points are not overly common, but there are large archaeological sites, but they just don't seem, many of them don't have a lot of stone material. Instead, we find fire hearths and storage pits and, and other things. So. Along the Connecticut, perhaps, you know, hunting was not so much of a priority, rather fishing. And again, I'm, I'm broadly stereotyping 13,000 years of the past into, you know, something. But, but it, it, from that little window, we can, we can see that, that, you know, um, that they're not these major stone working areas. That, but rather, there are Native American sites in the ground. They just evidence a different sort of thing going on. Probably summer fishing and and uh, and you know nut collection camps things like that. Yeah. I'd like to check my understanding here. On the one hand, I think I heard you say that Native Americans made heavy use of the area along the river. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think I heard you say that there's very little archaeologic evidence that they were there. Right. So I'm wondering how does one make the inference that they did make heavy use of the area? Uh, well, um, so the inference is that. Uh, on the New Hampshire side, we know quite a bit about um, the uh, that Native Americans were there a lot. Uh, same down in Massachusetts, same all the way down to the mouth of the Connecticut River. So it is illogical to assume that you know somehow they just didn't go along the Vermont side all the way up to the Connecticut. Um, and in again, we do have a lot of um, anecdotal, informal collector information of people saying, hey, I found this eroding out of the bank. I found this. But we just haven't done a lot of large-scale professional archaeological digs on the Connecticut. Certainly also historically, um, we know the Connecticut was a major thoroughfare. And you know, if I, if I had talked till 9, I might have gotten to this slide where this you know, remarkable woman, Lisa Brooks, um, uh, down at Amherst, has done really uh, amazing work tying um, native um, oral history and myth into history and archaeology and anthropology and you know the Connecticut as things got very um, chaotic and hostile in the mid to late 1600s um, you know further down the Connecticut River um, the upper Connecticut became a refuge and in fact um, she talks about the Connecticut lakes you know the mouth of the uh, headwaters of the Connecticut being considered sort of um, uh, the the land of the dead, of the spirits, and a place to which they would go and seek, you know, shelter that, you know, was really, you know, terra incognita to to um, Europeans and then eventually Americans into the 1700s. And she has these great maps that show that, you know, they say, um, you know, Abnaki up in that region, that Upper Connecticut Lakes region. Um, so certainly this was a thoroughfare, and we know that Coas. Um, you know, in, at the Newberry area, we have a documented um, Native American village and, and Jesuit mission site there into the late, um, uh, it was burned in 1672. Um, uh, and so, you know, certainly that was a major Native American village. And so we know, at least from that slice, Native Americans are going up and down the Connecticut. And it's no different than, um, than there, there's no reason to presume it's any different any time in the past. But like the Missiscoy that I showed, um, if you find anything at all, it will either be on the eroding banks or you'll have to dig very deep because it's an alluvial floodplain. And so 
you know, you're probably not going to find a lot just walking along the plowed fields because many of the things are probably buried under feet or yards of soil. Um, and so, you know, uh, if anything, you'll just find the thinnest veneer of, you know, this late woodland or contact period stuff. Uh, yeah? Well, I just wanted, I just had a tag sale. A guy said, well, here's my collection of arrowheads from the Great Meadows in Putney, which was gigantic. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't buy them. I should have. I was <laughs> a little mad at me. Um, I think a lot of Europeans just collected a lot of stuff just walking around, like you said, the the fields. Yeah, they did. They certainly did. The Putney Historical Society has a whole indigenous collection and with some and somebody had a incredible sculpture on his front porch which was indigenous that he found and kept. And then he took it in, who knows what he did with it, because too many people were dropping by to look at it. But I think there was a probably a ton of European Or th there absolutely there. was. And 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 what we see is you know what we it's remarkable that we still find you something. know something <laughs> um, but um, but we can definitely see that anywhere that was farmed and particularly anywhere with that fertile floodplain soil um, we find the deeper stuff and then we find that the top stuff that was in the plow zone is often picked over and so right. we still find spear points and we and but the plow zone is less important to us anyway it's not unimportant we can still reconstruct many things for us but in general the plow zone is already mixed up so it's already got a you know a, a less level of integrity um, and so we look for the things that are preserved below that now obviously if they dug fire pits or storage pits below that that's what we still find that's what we you know sort of hang our head on or in these floodplain areas, the things that are just buried deeply through fl floodplain soils um, are also, you know, extremely important. But we can, you know, do things with the plow zone stuff. But what we found is that the biggest thing that farmers all the way back in the 19th century collected were the bigger groundstone tools like axes, celts, gouges, because those were the things that, you know, you didn't need to know anything. They would come up when you were plowing and they'd say, oh, this is cool, you know. And so you see very early on those going into, you know, sort of family collections and things like that. Um, but, you know, when you mentioned the Putney Historical Society, or I don't know if the Dummerstens Historical Society, I'd be happy to look at any collection you might have. Um, the real important things are, like, if you knew something was, say, at the Putney Meadows, well, that would be great. You know, then I could I document it. No, I know. And, and certainly as, as an archaeologist, um, you know, I'm not going to tell anyone to not, well, I will, but, yeah. um, but, uh, <laughs> but I certainly myself can't partake in any buying and selling of artifacts. And people often contact me and say, hey, I found this. How much is it worth? And that's something I can't, you know, A, I don't know, and B, I wouldn't you know, sort of, set, or even condone the, the commodification of particular artifacts anyway, because it all facilitates this black market. If people know there's a market for it, or, you know, um, then they will continue to do it. And, you know, it's, um, it's not so much of an issue in this day and age in Native American artifacts in Vermont, although you still see them in eBay and auction houses and stuff. But it is rampant in like the Southwest with uh, oh, Southwestern yeah. pottery and anything like that, and there's a huge market for it, and it, it enough so that it's it's uh, it is um, very tempting for nefarious people to go out and loot mm -hmm. archaeological sites because profit can be made, and so to participate in that, however tangentially, is unimportant. I will say that in Vermont, um, there is the buying and selling of. Um, historic artifacts found through metal detecting, and we see that come up quite a bit. Um, and that is something I also, you know, you know, don't condone at all. Yeah? Are you going to be working with the folks when they do 142 for the new Hinsdale Bridge? Hinsdale, I'm sure we will. Um, if there, what, it, um, it's Hinsdale to where is it crossing? Brattleboro. 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 Oh. Yeah, um, I'm sure it's already been looked at by my VTrans colleagues. Um, some of those bridge areas have been looked at and, and found to just be already so profoundly disturbed that um, you know there's there's nothing left intact. Um, but other areas certainly. Yeah, well, th this area, the bridge is moving from its current location, so I understand there's a whole area of land along 142 that hasn't been touched. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. 
Yeah. And the, I know that the VTrans. I can check with my VTrans colleagues, yeah. but absolutely, I mean that you know, that wouldn't slip under their radar. Yeah, they that, did a report on. The, hmm? I think they did a report on that a number of years ago. Oh, they did. Oh, okay. I remember reading it. Okay. A long time ago, so I don't remember what was in it, but yeah. Sarah's an archaeologist. She actually helped start the Vermont Archaeology Heritage Center, and uh, with Giovanna, so I you know she developed the database that I use, so I'm in, eternally in her debt. Yeah. I would highly recommend that you look into what is going on down in Vernon, because at the public presentation they had September 14th at the Brattleboro Municipal Center, I was able to get them to admit that the bridge is being constructed by New Hampshire in Vermont under an interstate agreement where Vermont, where Vermont has no responsibility for what's going on in Vermont. No, no that, that's not exactly true. No. 142 is Vermont's responsibility. Actually, ma'am, it is not, and the person who said so is the V-Trans engineer who was present I, I was at that meeting. And I've also documented it in the interstate agreement, which is a public document. There, well, I, no. you know, I don't know the exact yeah. things, but I can tell you that uh, Vermont is responsible for Vermont land. What, what, um, who pays for the bridge, though, has been worked out with various agreements. Um, like I know the Vilas Bridge in Bellows Fall, that is New Hampshire's responsibility to pay for the rehabilitation. But in as much as it affects anything on the Vermont side, we will work with the New Hampshire transportation to uh, mitigate any adverse effects. That is, that is part of it. It's our land. That's why, uh, that's why I'm not recommending that you do this. I think the interesting part is is that the boundary between New Hampshire and Vermont isn't necessarily the Vermont shoreline. In right? case, it I may be out in the river somewhat. It's like the dam at Vernon. Mm -hmm. Some of those generators down there are in Vermont, and some of those generators are in New Hampshire because the border... Mm -hmm. the border it's actually the, the New Hampshire, it, technically all of the Connecticut River to some water line is New Hampshire. Right, but that's out in the middle and, of the river. Right, now. and there's various benchmarks along the river that show where the where it is. And in some cases it's pre-impoundment, in some right. cases it's after impoundment, and it's all been worked out. So but I, I will say from a from a controlling perspective, the funding uh, for various bridges based on interstate agreements is, you know, some were Vermont was responsible for, some, you know, New Hampshire was responsible for. But we don't abdicate our authority over the land on Vermont. That is still, that is still under our purview, and we consult with them about what we like to see. And I know this because I'm involved in these discussions. So, yeah. You showed a couple of maps, several maps of Vermont, and it occurred to me that th there must be comparable work being done in New York and in New Hampshire and in, and in Quebec and Massachusetts yeah. and so on. Do they all use the same uh, no. paradigms? No. I, I, oh, well, paradigms, um, yes, broadly speaking, what we call culture history, how we slice up time. But how we map it, yeah. how we report all it, those dots. all those dots, no. <laughs> and just dots. and um, that is the next move. We are, in fact, I was just in a conference call today with you know, one of the you know, superstars of our field, Dave Anderson out of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, who um, runs an open source program um, called uh, the Digital Index of North American Archaeological Sites. Wow. And um, I am working with him to give, us, to give him all of our accumulated data from uh, Vermont, and what he does is run it through various things and clean it so that the site locations are protect, are protected, but they're actually get into 20 kilometer rasters, and then um, and then you can look at the whole continent and see the density of archaeological sites. So individual site locations are protected so they can't be you know looted or anything, but still the aggregate data is out there. Um, on a more nuanced level, we are starting to work. You know. I am working with my state archaeologist colleagues to try to, you know, share data across state lines to understand how you know it's no, it's it's becoming a um, feasible now to use these huge synthetic data sets. You know, uh, you know, just talking to my graduate school advisor. You know, I was complaining about 
Excel one day, and she was like, Excel? I had to do my dissertation with punch cards and wait in line, you know? And so it's so true. I mean, the, the ability to manipulate huge data sets is becoming, you know, really doable now, not just with the supercomputer at the university campus, but on your laptop. And so we're getting to the point now where all of these, you know, really, you know, big data sets are going to be able to be shared. And, you know, so I'm hoping not tomorrow, but in the next few years, yeah, we'll have a, you know, northeast wide, you know, data set, you know, with appropriate protections. But, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, folks. Appreciate it. And we have a, um, a meeting uh, at the Learning Collaborative on the deer herd. Is it too big, too small? What should be done about managing the deer herd on Tuesday the 24th? And we have a meeting in this room on November 15th uh, about beavers in our area and why they're important to the watershed and uh, what how uh, Patty, is gonna, Patty Smith is going to talk about her uh, experiences in observing beavers and Skip Lyle is going to be talking about how he has made it possible for beavers to be in places where they previously uh, were too much of a pain in the neck so people would get rid of them, how, how they've set it up so that they can be there. So that's what we've got coming up over the next bit. So, so stay tuned if you don't hear from us and you have a computer, uh, put your name on our email list up there and we have send out emails, otherwise watch the newspapers. We try to get information out. So, and we All right. Well, thanks again. Appreciate it.